The year was 1952. The place, Atlantic City. The event, a very special convention hosted by the American Nurses Association and the National League of Nursing Education. Invited to attend were 1,000 student nurses. When we got to Atlantic City, so let's be honest about it, the sun was shining, the, they got on the boardwalk, and the bikes were running, the, uh, we were having fun. It was a great experience. The American Nurses Association had invited the students to explore the possibility of forming a student council within its organization. The student nurses, however, had a different plan, to break off on their own, to form their own independent organization. When the students wanted to go their own way, I think the feeling pretty much was they felt they wanted to be independent. They did not want to have others dictate, uh, such as NLN, ANA, to them as far as how they would run their organization. The students wanted to have their own independent organization. They uh, got together, there were a thousand students in Atlantic City in 1952 at the convention. It's time that we organize a national organization and that we organize independently. And with that decision, a 50-year legacy was born that would become known worldwide as the National Student Nurses Association. We felt good about forming our own organization. There was a feeling of a, a just jubilation almost once we did it. And no, I don't think anyone could truly have envisioned this. I mean, I don't think any of us were carrying the, uh, the flag to that extent. We wanted to have an organization because we thought there was a value to it. With the support and sponsorship of the American Nurses Association and the National League for Nursing, the National Student Nurses Association was on its way. The students could hardly contain their enthusiasm, but would soon find out that there was a lot of work to be done. When we organized, we had no bylaws. We had no constitution. We had no answers to questions. NSNA became a child of the American Nurses Association, the National League for Nursing. And they helped to support us um, but they stayed in the background so that we could do our own bylaws, our own constitution, figure out how we were going to pay our dues. So in the next year, in 53, the meeting was in Cleveland. And in Cleveland, that's where we uh, adapted the uh, constitution, the bylaws, and elected our first uh, 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 officers. And it was very exciting because we had some very, very fine quality uh, candidates. And I think from that, we had a good start. When NSNA first started in 1952-1953, the dues were 15 cents. And there was no way that they could collect 15 cents from each student. So as a practical matter, the schools actually included the 15 cents in their tuition for the nursing schools and sent that to the state association which then sent it to the national association. And this evolved over time to be a, a method of dues collection. The next order of business for the fledgling organization was to create its own logo and motto. Russell O'Mara, a nursing student from the Mills School of Nursing, Bellevue Hospital, designed the first logo. The organization's motto, not for ourselves, but for others, hinted at the first deliberate steps NSNA would take that year to reach out across the world. That reach would extend all the way to the emperor of Ethiopia. Haile Selassie was coming to the University of Minnesota and I was asked if I would like to present him with a gift since his daughter was a nurse. I presented Haile Selassie with a $100 uh, certificate so that he could buy books for the uh, hospital in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And so it was my first association with anyone international and it was very thrilling. As NSNA began to grow and to collect dues and to become financially independent and they were less dependent on the NLN and the ANA, they hired their own staff, they had their own offices and they began to develop very independently from the American Nurses Association and the NLN. That independence would also allow the students to conduct their own annual meetings, which were held in conjunction with the ANA and NLN conventions. 
It was an opportunity for the students to share ideas, address important issues, and to let off a little steam. Oh, our conventions were a ball. I mean, we had a great time. We had talent shows, we had meetings, we had booths set up, we had career planning. We went on tours of the city, and toward the end of the convention, on the last day, we always wore our uniforms. So we got to see what the caps were like from the different states. But it was wonderful to see students from all over the nation. NSNA would not be what it is today if it wasn't for Ms. Tompkins. Frances Tompkins, the association's first executive director, would come to symbolize the ideas and the ideals of NSNA. She provided the inspiration and the foundation that defines the organization today. She was a mentor and a visionary. She was a woman of extraordinary vision, even more patience, a respect for youth, and courageous in the sense that she allowed us to do what we believe was right. She had a vision for the Student Association being a very independent association. She really uh, molded the students and, and helped bring their leadership skills along. She never really told students what it was they were supposed to do, but she provided the resources for them, you know, for uh, the Student Association to make uh, incredible decisions. In some ways, you know, having the Student Association deal with issues like student power and so forth, she planted those seeds. You know, I, I'd, I'd like to think that the students came up with that, but I really think it was Frances. Uh, she was such a smart woman and, and very, very caring about the association, very passionate. Frances was just terrific. In 1961, under the guidance of Frances Tompkins and NSNA past president Mary Denisades, the National Student Nurses Association took another bold step in international relations. The Taiwan Project addressed the needs of nursing students on the other side of the world. And this came about because they had been hearing about the conditions under which Taiwanese nursing students were living. For example, there were six in a room. Uh, they had no place to hang their uniforms. They had no storage space. And the students felt that they could help students in another country and wanted very much to do that. The National Student Nurses Association of the United States of America paid a visit to Taiwan. Past President Mary Denisatis and I represented American student nurses on this visit. Today, we are visiting the Army 801 General Hospital. Nursing students of the National Defense Medical Center, NDMC, have part of their clinical experience here. The project was a huge success. Selling shares at 25 cents each, NSNA raised more than $35,000 to build and furnish a dormitory for Taiwanese nursing students. In 1969, following her retirement, the foundation of the National Student Nurses Association was established to honor Frances Tompkins. This foundation, along with the Promise of Nursing Capital Campaign, raises thousands of dollars to support undergraduate nursing education. Since 1970, we have given a couple of million dollars out to, in scholarships to undergraduate nursing students. And NSNA is, has now established an endowed scholarship fund through the foundation of the NSNA and the Promise of Nursing Endowment. And this is a way that NSNA can contribute to the advancement of undergraduate nursing education, uh, the scholarships are geared uh, to not only to students entering nursing school, but also to students with associate degrees and diplomas who wish to go on for bachelor's degrees. In the early 1960s, membership was at an all-time high. Schools of nursing automatically included NSNA dues, now set at $1 as part of student fees. NSNA was flourishing. The future never looked brighter but soon it too would have to respond to the changing political landscape. The civil rights movement focused the country on a single cause. I have a dream. We really began to pay attention to the injustices, uh, 
that were being imposed upon minorities. And while we didn't, uh, as an organization, take to the streets as other groups did, we did take the issue seriously. The House of Delegates of the National Student Nurse Association adopted what came to be known as the Breakthrough Project. And the Breakthrough Project was intended to uh, focus on recruitment of minorities into nursing. And that was really a very proud moment. Many of the minorities uh, had even not even thought of becoming a nurse because they figured it was out of their reach. The students at, at NSNA, when I started working with them, a lot of times I was really uh, the first black that they have talked honestly with. And they did, in many cases, go against their families because their families are saying, why do you want minorities in, uh, in nursing? You don't know any, you know. Uh, and the students fought for their right to do this. Minority students had to change their minds also. Uh, they were just as skeptical as the whites were. But after a while, they were a group. We were breakthrough students. We weren't minority, we weren't this, we weren't that. We also had a big debate about how you define a minority in nursing. Um, because a lot of the men at that point in time, which was less than 2%, felt that they needed to be supported just as well as, as some of the racial or ethnic minorities. The Breakthrough to Nursing program continues to this day, attracting students from all walks of life to the profession. The war in Vietnam sparked protests that galvanized students from the late 60s into the early 70s. For the most part, student nurses stayed off the front lines, not because they wanted to, but because they had no choice. Nursing students got caught up in the 60s, just like every other student in the United States. I remember when I was a nursing student in, in the late 60s, around the time of the anti-Vietnam War march in Washington, D.C., the principal of the nursing school came in to our classroom and said, there's going to be a march in Washington, and if any of you are planning to go, don't plan to come back to nursing school. And this was a definite violation of, of individual rights. And I think as, as students began to realize that they did have rights, they began to uh, exert themselves and protest that they were being told what to do in violation of their rights. Unable to exercise their rights, Many student nurses focus their rebellious energies on the needs of the less fortunate. And I became a little bit uh, more attuned to some of the uh, social issues that were going on. And in that year, 1968, there were a lot of social issues going on. And if you think about those times, we were about the great society. We were gonna make lots of things better. We were very much altruists, and in some respects, radicals because we could make it better. We believed that very firmly. True to their motto, not for ourselves, but for others, the National Student Nurses Association embarked on the Appalachian Project. 35 NSNA members would spend the summer in Appalachia, helping to provide health care services to those who would otherwise go without. The Appalachian Project was a result of activism among all the students, not only in nursing, but in medicine and pharmacy and dentistry and so forth. And uh, the, um, they formed a coalition. For many students, the Appalachian Projects, the Migrant Projects, were a tremendous eye-opener. We went places where the running water in the house was a pump on the, on the front porch, that the electrical service was a bare bulb if there wasn't, where people didn't understand that feeling good was something that was intrinsic to people. Any student who is involved in not only the Appalachian projects, but the community health centers, the migrant projects, went away with probably two real thoughts. One is that they could make a difference, that there was actually something they could do um, on an individual level, and that two, that that difference was enhanced when you had partners. And I think it really began a whole session of activism that carried over into a lot of public policy and public range, because the students of my era, there's a lot of us that ended up in public service, 
and in some very influential positions that I think grew out of those, those ideas that students could be activists. 1968 saw the publication of the first edition of Imprint Magazine. Replacing a newsletter that only went to the schools of nursing, Imprint would now be sent directly to each individual member, providing the students with a forum to express opinions that might not otherwise be heard. That it was an opportunity for the association to communicate with individual members instead of uh, depending on sending newsletters to uh, schools and hoping that the information was going to reach the members. It became a voice um, for students to talk with other students about the issues that concern them. It's important for students to have their own voice and for NSNA to stand as its own organization and to be proud of the reputation that it's built and the voice that it's used. It's used its voice very well over the years. Talent shows and uniform days were by now a thing of the past. NSNA had found its political voice, its focus and direction for the future. It was no longer a stepchild trying to please the parent organizations. As you then go through the decades and you see NSNA flourishing as an organization where it more and more took independent actions to give uh, direction to nursing students and nursing students get in there and debate issues not only relevant to nursing but issues uh, relevant to society as a whole. It was in the early 70s and they were interested in a lot of the societal problems that were happening at that time. They also, because of their independence, were uh, concerned about things like their uniforms. A lot of them did not want to wear a uniform or the hats. I remember the nursing hats was going out the door. And many times the symbol of a cap didn't equal uh, the intelligence that we had in our head. By the time I graduated in 71, chapel was no longer required, the dress code was abolished, the miniskirt was the least of your worries. There had been a real change in, in the requirements of, of the external trappings to look at what are we instilling internally. More changes were on the horizon as students debated entry to practice. Delegates began to discuss a student bill of rights and responsibilities, advocating a student vote on curriculum committees. They even supported ANA's efforts to improve pay and working conditions for registered nurses by taking a stand against the use of student nurses to fill in for striking RNs. Well, much to the credit of the National Student Nurses Association, they passed a resolution that said that nursing students should not be in a hospital where registered nurses are engaged in a labor dispute specifically a withdrawal of services or a mass resignation. That that's an unsafe environment, it is not educationally sound, it is not in the public's interest, the student's interest, or the interest of the institution for them to be there. That was a very bold move on the part of NSNA. One convention stands out in the history of NSNA, Miami Beach, 1970. The convention theme, give a damn. Give a damn about what's going on in the country. Uh, uh, not to just take things for granted. How can we change things that are going on? And um, we just came up with that title, Give a Damn Day. They had buttons and signs and every, every student uh, wore a button, give a damn. We felt we could make a difference, but you had to care, you had to give a damn. And so we ran around Miami wearing give a damn buttons, but we were trying to challenge people to care. And we asked people to care about each other, about their patients. To get a first-hand appreciation of some of the social conditions they were giving a damn about, many of the students put themselves on a welfare diet. I think at that time, welfare recipients were living on about 35 cents a day, if I recall. And they would go into the restaurants and <laughs> whatever they could get, they'd pick up the sugar or whatever was free and put that in the water for substance and so forth. They just wanted to have the feel of what these people were living through. People challenged you to, to subsist on a welfare diet, which for a lot of folks was macaroni and 
um, welfare cheese, the processed cheese and, and things for a day and to take the money that you saved and put it to better use. And I think it made us realize that we were terribly fortunate and that even though some of us didn't have a lot, we had more than others. And you could really see how you could make a difference, that you could put that give a damn feeling into practice. The early 70s saw a dramatic shift in nursing education. Hospital-based diploma schools were on the decline as the profession struggled to bring nursing education into the mainstream of higher learning. Nursing students were isolated from other students. They were not in the mainstream of higher education. They were isolated in hospital schools uh, where they didn't have interaction with students from other disciplines. We live in a society where education is highly valued. Therefore, the fact that we were not educated in a university setting uh, certainly impacted the public's perception of what is a nurse. It wasn't really until nursing education uh, moved to community colleges and universities where they were getting bachelor's degrees that they began to realize that there was a whole other student body out there. The theme was to move nursing education from diploma programs, from hospital-based programs, to the university setting. I think what the profession was trying to say is that in the future we all need more education, and nurses are not an exception. So it was just a matter of moving with the times. The association was ready to take another giant leap forward by formally recognizing the growing influence and power the student body had achieved. In 1974, delegates passed a Student Bill of Rights and Responsibilities. The issues in NSNA that I remember working on uh, were very interesting. They, they dealt with students' rights, and we actually worked on a Student Bill of Rights, and I think it was also reflective of the, the uh, growing political awareness of the student movements in the 70s, um, and being aware that you know, there, there's a give and take when you're a student and when you go to school you are looking for a good education and that the return on that good education, you want to be invo actively involved in uh, working with the faculty for promoting the kind of education that you would consider um, optimal. And it was a really fun time and it, it kind of challenged the traditional hierarchy and the authority of our schools of nursing. NSNA's first solo convention was held in Salt Lake City in 1974. The students were no longer willing to be tied to ANA and NLN convention schedules, which often coincided with spring exams and graduations. It was a huge risk. Fortunately, the event turned a profit, as vendors and advertisers recognized the potential of the student nurses. One of the things that happened was we hired a marketing person, uh, Tony Gennetti, who is still with the organization today. And he's the one that really marketed the nursing students. And I think the need that we needed to stand on our own gave us more independence. And so for the first time we had exhibits at the meeting, we had advertisements. That's the first time we brought revenue in that was non-dues related. The structure of NSNA underwent a transformation in the late 70s as the organization's bylaws were revised and school chapter representation was included in the House of Delegates. It would now be easier for students and faculty to be involved in the association, strengthening NSNA's role in leadership development. I learned a lot. I learned parliamentary procedure. I learned to be comfortable in the presence of senior nurses. I learned to be comfortable expressing my point of view, even if it wasn't the popular point of view. One of the things that NSNA taught me to do was to listen to divergent viewpoints and to pull from those a consensus path to find agreement um, on a course of action and to act on it. I've used that every day. I think one of the advantages of all of this, however, is the fact that having developed a pre-professional nursing organization, it is, in my view, uh, it's a training period, it's a, it's a practicum in leadership. They can go to a business meeting and they know about parliamentary procedure. Uh, they can deal with an issue and gather data to support their argument. Uh, they are really 
taught in that, in that period when they are members of the student organization to really develop and to come forward so that they can make a significant contribution. By implementing its own code of ethics, NSNA had formalized its expectation for professional, academic, and clinical conduct. The code of ethics has two parts to it. One part is the uh, code for behavior within the professional organization. How does one conduct themselves? How does one conduct the business of the association? The second part is the code of academic and clinical conduct, which gives students guidance in the classroom and in the clinical setting. It sets a standard for them to guide their behavior and guide their professional development. And this is quite a significant contribution that NSNA is making to nursing education. Because of NSNA, I'm assured that there is a stream of leaders and knowledgeable nurses being created across the country, that 20,000 and more each year are being touched by the excellent information that NSNA offers, by opportunities in both state and national leadership roles that are preparing students who will soon become professional registered nurses. To capitalize on these leadership skills, NSNA developed the NSNA Leadership University. This program encourages faculty to offer academic credit for participating in NSNA leadership activities. The program both enhances education and propels careers. And it's a framework, um, paperwork, that's already developed for the student to access from NSNA to present to their faculty and say, this is what I have been doing, this is what I have learned, I'd like to get credit. So Leadership View is giving credit where credit is due. For example, our board members, by participating as a national elected officer, are actually able to get college credit so that they're not trying to do both their coursework and their NSNA work, that they're bringing the two together and being able to, to be recognized for the learning that takes place in NSNA. NSNA members past and present have an impact on healthcare. NSNA's 50th anniversary celebration in 2002 was a testament to the organization's legacy as nurse leaders returned to celebrate the organization that gave them their start. The networking, the communication, the partnerships, the collaboration, absolutely life-forming um, opportunities as a student. And they have really served me as a professional over my whole career. It gave me a lot of preparation for my future life. It was a very good experience. NSNA's experience took me to places I'd never been. I met people I never would have thought I'd, I'd have met. Um, and career-wise, it did the same thing. That it totally transformed my life. And that is not an overstatement. NSNA. From starched caps to student demonstrations to professional leadership. It's the ongoing story of nursing students who care enough to lead the future of nursing.